So Dr. Joe, we've been starting to talk about ADD, ADHD. There's a lot of new research out I'd love to hear about. But there definitely is. Um, we are about to start a program for kids. This is uh, teenagers and preteens at the Tully Health Center and um, more importantly at the Chelsea Piers location for kids who have symptoms of ADD and whether they're on medication or they're not on medication, we want to be using alternative approaches that work in conjunction with the Western approaches to help really treat some of the medical problems that we're seeing. And the idea is that this isn't an alternative, this is in addition or maybe even sometimes before we need to put someone on medication. It seems like the prevalence is so high now. I hear about so many of my colleagues and friends' children suffering from ADD or ADHD. How high is the prevalence? Amy, so it's a great question. And, and what we know from the CDC is that there are two important facts. One is that as of 2011, the pr percentage of the population, kids that is, less than 17 with ADD, was 11%. So that's every one in 10 kids is going to have these symptoms. And the other thing that's interesting, which we've talked about before, is that the prevalence is actually increasing. In, in 2002, it was only at about maybe 5 or 6 or 7%, and it seems to be going up the further we get into the decade. So is it increasing because we're better diagnosing, or are there factors that's giving us a higher prevalence of this issue? And, and again, a very good question. So the answer is that we definitely are more on top of this. What in the 1970s, when I grew up, would be seen as a boisterous boy who didn't listen, would probably be diagnosed now as someone with ADD. But the question is whether this is always ADD. And there are other things that this can be that can fake. They can essentially look like ADD, but they're not ADD. And that can be um, things like uh, abnormal blood glucose causing hypoglycemia. If you're not eating properly, that can have an effect. If you have deficiency of certain minerals like ferritin and zinc, the important minerals that you get from food. Um, and then, of course, we have behavioral things such as um, anxiety that looks like it's ADD. And then, of course, just general boredom. So not everything that looks like ADD is ADD, and even if it is ADD, there are behavioral alternative approaches that can really help in addition to the Western approaches. And I know it's so important to address the issue because when a child has ADD or ADD, ADHD, they're not able to learn. So they're missing out on that optimal academic time. They're not able to make social positive relationships. So it's a crucial juncture. No doubt about that. So in terms of what we are looking at, just to remember, Kids with ADD may also have other issues. They have learning difficulties. They may have behavioral issues like oppositional defiance, like um, uh, other types of depression, etc. And all of these need to be looked at in the context of lifestyle. So one of the main things that we do at Tully and Chelsea Piers is looking at lifestyle. How does the kid eat? How do they sleep? How do they move? The human body needs to move eat and sleep every day and it needs to do it properly. If it doesn't do it properly, you are starting your day at a deficit, you're starting at a disadvantage. So all of that is stuff that we're gonna look at in great detail. So even though the medications such as Ritalin or Adderall are very effective, it's not enough because it's just a small part of the package. That's exactly it. And also, not that I'm anti-medication, if you need it, you take it, but there are definitely side effects, weight loss, and sometimes anxiety and problems sleeping. So this is like every substance going to come with potential side effects. So what's neat about integrative approaches is that they really don't have a lot of side effects, and they can be used as an adjunct to the conservative standard treatment, and that is medication and definitely behavioral techniques. Behavioral techniques are not always looked at. About a third of kids don't get behavioral technique training, and they need that. There are behavioral things that you can do to help with your kids with ADD. So then hopefully the children can be weaned off medication perhaps down the road, but they'll have all of these other parts of their lives in place. Whether they can be weaned off or whether they're on the lowest dose, all of that is great. So in terms of you know, specifically diet, there are definitely a number of eating plans that are individual. One of them is based on the idea that if you eat a high sugary food like a Pop-Tart at about 7 o'clock in the morning and then you have 
some, I don't know, soda, your blood glucose has gone up, yes. your insulin level has now gone up, your blood glucose has now gone down, it's now quite low, and you are starting to feel jittery. That looks exactly, Amy, like ADD. Yes. And in fact, so you have to prime the system with proper eating. That's one type of eating thing. The other thing is that there seems to be some evidence, and this comes out of research by Dr. Feingold, that certain foods people may have a sensitivity or even actually an allergy to. So one of the main interventions we do is to look at food sensitivities. That doesn't mean that if you eat the food you get hives. That is a classical food allergy. This is the fact that eating certain foods may cause a behavior that is not what you want, and you seem to do better if you avoid certain foods. It's more of a sensitivity, and unfortunately there's no very reliable blood test for it. It has to be done clinically, and should be done under the supervision of a diet, because it is a somewhat of a physician, because it's a somewhat restrictive diet. And it seems to be that whenever we look at the whole package, what kind of foods are triggers, what kind of foods are going to unbalance the mood even more, it's crucial to look at the schools and what kind of food schools are serving, I would think. There's no question about it, which brings us on to a very famous case in Wisconsin of essentially a load of kids, about 120 of them, who were kids with serious problems. They had oppositional defiant, they had conduct disorder, they were truant, they were not the world's best kids. And they were in a remedial school, essentially, in the area. And what happened was that they changed the nutrition. They gave people proper food. And what they saw, both reported by the kids, better sleep, better concentration, and reported by the teachers, is that these kids seem to do a lot better, much less truancy, much less behavioral problems. So food is a major component of this. It's not the only component, but a major one. And it makes sense, because whatever you're ingesting is going to come out behaviorally in some form or fashion. No question about it. Activity is another thing. Chelsea Piers has a number of programs designed for activity. Sleep is something we look at, and we will use stress management techniques to help with sleep. And then again, a lot of the time, we will do blood tests to check for deficiencies. Not crazy, weird blood tests, general blood tests that should be covered by insurance. And when levels are low, we give this, we supplement with judicious use of supplements so that your body is getting optimal nutrition. So, for example, I hear a lot about magnesium. Have you seen any correlations? So we use magnesium more actually for anxiety and for sleep issues, but we do know that there's a significant percentage of the population that don't actually eat enough magnesium, and that has health consequences. But instead of just taking magnesium and getting essentially diarrhea, a better move would be to get your magnesium level checked. If it is normal, you are fine, and if it is low, you need to be repleted. And it makes so much sense for children for us to look at the entire picture. They're eating, they're sleeping, their activity. I know today's kids aren't as active. That's they simply absolutely aren't. right. And I think it would make ADD and ADHD much more difficult. No question. And then in terms of certain supplements we use, there are botanicals that are used, Indian herbs that have been used for thousands of years for concentration. There is really some good evidence for the use of homeopathy, though I know homeopathy is controversial, but there are at least Swiss randomized trials from Switzerland that seem to suggest that if you have the right dose of the right homeopathic remedy, that also can have an effect. And so our program is looking at everything. We're looking at the sleeping, we're looking at the eating, we're looking at the supplements, we're looking at blood levels, we're looking at the complete picture to give you a comprehensive plan in addition and a Again, I must, inter to, I must also say to integrate into what you're already doing to optimize your kids' ADHD. So I think the two key words, the take-homes, are comprehensive and integrate. Absolutely. It's not an either-or. It's really how to help children function at the most optimal level. Absolutely. Thanks so much for tuning in. Thank you. Dr. Joe Minich, Feuerstein, MD.